Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Monaco Devices uh, webinar series. Uh, we'll be starting in just one minute um, as soon as my uh, slides are um, shown online. I should see something now? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar on uh, using high throughput RNA screening to identify host factors that impact viral infection. Um, I wanted to give you a little, uh, if there's any uh, short introduction, if there are any questions, uh, technical questions about uh, uh, the audio or the video, please um, submit them to a, a Q&A uh, window, which I'll, I'll go through in just a second, and otherwise uh, there are the options to call where that's technical support. I'll give you a moment to write that number down. Um, the agenda is I'll give a very, very short introduction to um, Game of Success Icon and Screen Systems from Molecular Devices. Then we have uh, Sarah Cherry, so, um, that will be the, our featured speaker, uh, talking about her work on RNA screening. And then there's a, um, uh, the Jane Hesley will moderate um, some questions, so please uh, submit questions to your Q&A. Okay. And how do you do that? So if you um, uh, would like to submit a question, you can go up to the, the, top, uh, the top of the window, uh, click on the an, uh, a little arrow to get the Q&A uh, up here. Okay, click on the Q&A. That will uh, bring up a dialog box that allows you to type a question in. Please direct those, that question to all panelists so that we can all see it, and then press the Send button to send it to us. Okay. So um, the stock is going to be using uh, one of the techniques we're going to be using is uh, high content screening. High content screening is a way to automate your uh, image analysis, acquisition and analysis um, uh, across multiple states. And a number of applications are enabled uh, with high content screening, including uh, those shown here. And we have the sector under pectosis. Angiogenesis assays, some very simple steroid analysis shown. Uh, very popular in the neurobiology field is neuroid outgrowth and some genotoxicity assays to find um, a high resolution to find uh, budding of um, uh, bits of uh, your nuclei that haven't uh, uh, um, divided correctly. The workflow is to um, get your sample into multiple plates. Acquire those images, perform image analysis to convert those images into numbers, do some type of uh, data analysis across your screen, and you also have to have some type of storage and management because you, you generate lots and lots of uh, images and measure them. Medical Devices uh, offers a complete solution uh, for this workflow, including the Image Express Micro, as shown in the top left, which is a wide field cyclone screening system. The Image Express Ultra, which is a focal uh, product. Uh, these are both uh, tied together with a data management solution called NDC Store. And then that allows you to interact with your images and do uh, convert those images into measurements with either Meta Express or, um, or those research applications and Meta Express Talk or when you need to uh, need the throughput of analysis to go across hundreds and hundreds of things. And then lastly, we have a QD Express software for fit selection to be able to uh, do sort of a screen-centric view and screen-centric data now and analytics. Okay. So uh, Sarah Cherry is, uh, uses the images micro, and she her, her screens on for compounds, which is, is um, using uh, doing RNA screening. Um, Sarah is uh, right now at the University of Pennsylvania, but she did. For, um, um, excuse me, sorry. Um, she's a grad student, worked at MIT with David Baltimore, and her postdoc at Harvard with uh, Norbert Perrimon. Uh, she began at the University of Pennsylvania in 2006. Um, uh, research in the Cherry Lab is aimed at identifying um, cellular factors that, that regulate viral pathogenesis, including those factors 
hijacked by viruses for replication, um, and, and those innate uh, antiviral mechanisms used by the host to combat the invader. To identify these factors, Sarah's lab is taking a genetic approach by screening for factors that impact viral replication. Uh, there's a number of techniques she uses, including um, the RNA interference screens which, in cell culture, which, which you will hear about, as well as genetic screens in the software. So, uh, Sarah, um, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the uh, approach that my lab has taken, to, as uh, Krisha said, to, to try to identify cellular factors that impact uh, host pathogen interactions, and my lab is mainly focused on uh, viral pathogens. But at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about some work that was done with um, toxoplasma, which is a eukaryotic parasite. So I just want to start by giving a little overview about how we see the problem and why we think that, that um, this high throughput, high content imaging is a really good solution to identify um, the things that we're interested in. So, um, so viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens with very limited encoding capacity and as such have to co-opt and subvert a large number of pathways and processes within cells. And in order to uh, accomplish this, they um, have to uh, modulate host uh, pathways such as translation, transcription, et cetera. And so the identification of factors that are required for viral replication allows us to identify new therapeutic targets. This infection of obviously doesn't occur in cells in space, but actually obviously occurs in organisms that have a, a battery of uh, factors and pathways whose role it is to try to prevent or restrict infection. And so those are the factors that are involved in antiviral defenses. And we're really interested in also in understanding the pathways and processes at play that organisms use to restrict infection. And we're particularly interested in factors that are present within infected cells that that autonomously try to uh, restrict infection. And more recently, those factors have been termed intrinsic innate immune factors, and we're interested in understanding how the cell recognizes infection and how it can um, activate pathways to try to block the ability of that pathogen to replicate within those cells. And so uh, we're also really interested in uh, a particular class of uh, viruses that are uh, very interesting to us because they can tra they transit through disparate hosts in order to uh, complete their life cycles. That is, there's a large number of insect-borne human viral pathogens that uh, infect uh, mosquitoes or ticks who then uh, transmit those pathogens to vertebrates by taking a blood meal. And so we're really very interested in understanding how these very small pathogens, their RNA viruses of about 10 kb in length, can reprogram and and survive within such uh, distinct hosts with very different lifestyles and very different immune systems. And so again, we think by understanding the similarities and differences between how these pathogens move through these different hosts will help us to understand not only more about biology, but also about different interventions that are possible. One interesting aspect of that, of that biology is that uh, the infection in the insect host is non-pathogenic, and it's non-pathogenic because the insect's innate immune system is able to suppress the infection to the level that it's non pathogenic to the host, whereas infection of vertebrate host tends to be quite pathogenic. And so while we think of insects as being more simple, in fact, they're much much better equipped to handle these pathogens. And again, we have really very little understanding of how that works. Okay, so just to remind you that these are important uh, pathogens, they're in a, a group of emerging and re-emerging viruses globally with uh, obviously the most uh, important uh, insect-borne human virus, which is dengue virus, where more than a billion people are at risk throughout the world. And there are other viruses listed here that are in different parts of the world that, again, are uh, important pathogens that, and or the particular pathogens that we're working on in the lab. Okay. And just to get back to this idea about intrinsic immunity, that, that these are factors that we're really very interested in understanding. Um, so these are the factors present within infected cells that can either be constitutive, such as genes like Ampervax that can restrict all the time. They can be induced, such as interferon-inducible genes. And there's also a lot of data to suggest there's a lot of cell type dependence to these um, factors. And so by screening and or looking for factors in different cell types, then they reveal uh, otherwise unknown mechanisms by which viruses can be restricted. So the approach that my lab has taken is um, a cell-based uh, screening approach where we have a variety of different perturbagens that we can use in order to identify, again, 
pathways and processes that play important roles in, in infection. And so we um, we don't do a lot with small molecules, although we've done some small molecule screening, but we mainly use RNA interference approaches to knock down genes of interest and then use a variety of downstream assays to look for what their effects are on the biology. We also have cDNA libraries that can be used um, by transcribing cells and looking for gain of function activities. And so um, basically the pipeline is the same. You start with some sort of perturbogen, you introduce it into cells, and then you have some sort of readout. And using that uh, robust uh, readout will allow you to find the outliers, that is the genes or uh, small molecules that uh, are important in the pathway of interest. So, um, so the way so the way that we've typically done these screens is using high throughput, high content um, assays at the, at the downstream, and in, and in part we do that because many of the viruses that we're working with don't have a reverse genetic system, so we have no uh, easy way to tell that, that which cells are infected other than using antibodies, and so. That, uh, that means that we can stain uh, for viral infection by using uh, immunofluorescence and automated microscopy. So the way that our pipeline is typically set up is that we have arrayed libraries in 384 well plates, where in each well would be a different perturbogen, so a different RNAi reagent or a different cDNA or a different cell molecule. We then um, feed the cells onto these libraries. We wait for uh, either knockdown or or expression off of the cDNA, then we infect with a pathogen of choice, then we wait for viral replication, and then we uh, fix and stain an image, again, using an antibody, usually against the viral antigen that's expressed upon successful infection. We always counter stain looking at the nuclei, so that also gives us a, a readout for the toxicity of any given uh, reagent that was put into the well, so then use automated microscopy, and we've been using the Image Express Micro for our work, and we, that allows us to image well by well in an automated fashion, where we can take multiple wavelengths um, and uh, capture the images in a plate in uh, an hour or two. Then we're then we're looking for the outliers, that is the genes that when when like for example knocked down block infection, those are the genes that are normally required for infection, so they're, they're promoting infection. And we're also looking for the genes that were knocked down that allow pathogens to be better, and those genes are, are thought of as antiviral or immune, anti immune genes. And so we try to set up the, the assays so that they're sensitive to both uh, genes that promote infection and genes that restrict infection. And then we use automated image analysis to identify the number of uh, cells per well, as well as the number of infected cells, as well as the level of infection per uh, cell, and we use those metrics to identify the genes that are play important roles in infection. And so, uh, the, we do a lot of our screening with Drosophila cells for a number of uh, reasons. One is that it's a model insect for these uh, insect-borne pathogens, but also um, because of robust RNAi uh, methodology. So. You don't even have to transcribe to solve those cells. They just um, pick up the long double-stranded RNAs, which then gets fed into the RNAi pathway to generate um, siRNAs within the, the cells, and those siRNAs then target genes for silencing. We typically get more than 95% knockdown, and it has very um, low off-target effects, which are predictable, and so we're able to um, validate genes that we identify in our screens much uh, in a very robust way, whereas the screens in the mammalian cells, a lot more downstream validation has to be done. And just to say that we're really interested in the innate immune aspects as well, and there's a lot of conservation between uh, genes that are involved in innate immunity and Drosophila as well as um, mammalian systems. So we think that this is a good system to try to identify factors that play roles in infection. So. The viruses that infect humans from insects are fall into three families of viruses, um, the alphaviruses, the phagoviruses, and the bunioviruses, which are all uh, RNA viruses that are very small um, with the characteristics shown here. And so what we've decided to do is to take basically one example virus from each of these families to do high-throughput, uh, high-content RNAi screening. And we finished the genome-wide RNAi screens for each of these viruses, and so now we're uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of this data from the primary and secondary screens, but we're really trying to know 
figure out what these genes are doing in terms of viral infection. So the first screen that we did was uh, using this virus called Simbit virus, which is a prototypical alpha virus that's present all over the old world. It normally cycles between birds and mosquitoes with uh, humans and uh, other large animals as incidental hosts. It's a model for really pathogenic alpha viruses, such as the encephalitic viruses, as well as chikungunya virus, which is a recently emerging virus that now has become endemic in Europe. So to do the screen, um, it's just like the pet plan that I showed you earlier, which is um, we have the G a genome-wide double-stranded RNAi library um, that we purchased from and that covers the 95% of the Drosophila genome, a rate in 384 well plates. We then take those plates and see Drosophila cells on them, which then uh, not specifically take up these, these RNAi reagents. We wait three days for knockdown. And then we, in fact, with Simbis virus, wait for 24 hours for viral replication, and then stain and image um, the plates, looking for, again, uh, all the cells in blue and the infected cells in green. And we use automated image analysis software where we can um, basically segment the image to identify all the cells by looking at the blue and look for the infected cells in green. And then we do statistical analysis on these images. We always do the screen in duplicate. And so we do statistical analysis using robust statistics to identify the outliers. And then we take those, those outliers or the candidates and then do downstream validation. We do a number of different things, but some of the basics are, are listed here. So we generate independent double strand RNAs to a different region of the gene. We, we then take those reagents, we screen in the original cell line as well as in an independent cell line. And we also use an independent assay, either a different strain of virus or a completely different uh, readout in order to, to get rid of all the um, background and the noise in the, in the assay and in the, uh, the RNA reagents. And then we use bioinformatics to try to figure out what's interesting and what, um, what kinds of genes and factors that might play important roles or pathways might be involved in infection. So in that screen, we identified about 200 genes in the, in the primary screen. And, and what, what you can see here is if you look for conservation with relevant hosts, such as mosquitoes and humans, we have a significant overrepresentation of genes that are highly conserved across hosts, so it's overrepresented for conserved with mosquitoes and humans, and it's actually underrepresented for Drosophila specific genes. And so that suggested to us that perhaps the screen worked uh, reasonably well to identify things that we that may play relevant um, roles in uh, hosts that are infected by these pathogens. So then we took the, those sets and we can do, for example, go enrichment analysis, and what we found, and all the things shown in, in red here are all genes that are involved in uh, classroom mediated endocytosis and acidification, which are pathways that are known to be required for entry of this virus in both insect and mammalian hosts. And so again, this validated that perhaps the screen worked reasonably well since we found the classes of genes that we expected. Again, for our validation, we took, um, we took, we took the set of genes that we identified in the primary screen and tested them against two, dis two different Drosophila cell lines, the original cell line that was used, which is DL1, and a, uh, another cell line, which is KC, and you can see that there's a, sig a significant number of the genes came out of both, uh, and, and some validated um, in the other cell line better than they validated in the original cell line, which was the old one. But nevertheless, we then took these 62 genes to look more carefully. We also used two different strain strains of virus that are that um, are both Simbis virus, and again, you can see a large uh, overlap of genes that um, came out of both strains. And so. One of the things that we were interested in is whether or not we identified the cell surface receptor for this virus. So there are no cellular receptors known for any alpha virus, which precludes the, the use of that as a therapeutic target. Receptors make good targets, and so we were looking to see if we had perhaps identified um, a receptor. And so basically by taking the intersection of the things that came out of multiple strains of this virus as well as multiple cell types, it converged on actually only one um, membrane receptor that was conserved in mammals, and that was a gene called NRAMP, which stands for Natural Resistance Associated Macrophage Protein, which is an, as, an acid-dependent um, divalent metal ion transporter that is, 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 plays essential roles in transporting divalent iron um, into cells. And so this, this receptor is present on the plasma membrane and also traffics via plasma-mediated endocytosis to a low-pH compartment 
expert uses the proton gradient to transport iron into the cytoplasm of cells. We already knew that this virus required class remediated endocytosis to get into a low-page compartment, so this, this, this makes a really nice receptor because it could bind to the receptor and piggyback uh, along the endocytic route into this compartment where it could be used um, into cells and initiate replication. And so we did a number of experiments to ask whether or not this is indeed uh, a receptor for this virus. And so we did a number of experiments. I'll just show you some of the data that shows that when we knock down NRAMP, we have a decrease in the infection of cells using um, a fluorescent we tagged virions. We could show that it's required. If we knock down NRAMP, we see a significant decrease in binding to Drosophila cells. And we could, gener we, we could obtain uh, flies that were mutant for, for this uh, transporter, and we found that there was a four log reduction in infectivity in, uh, in, the, in adult flies, suggesting that not only NRAMP is a, an entry receptor, is probably the only one in Drosophila. Of course, Drosophila is not the natural host, and so we were interested in extending this to mammalian systems. And so the closest homolog of the Drosophila NRAMP is NRAMP2, which is, as I said, this um, iron transporter that's essential in, in mammals. And so we generated flocks, mouse embryonic fibroblasts from, from mice that were generated by Nancy Andrews' lab, where we could use um, retroviral mediated uh, knockouts with, with pre, and we could show that when we knock out NRAMP2 in these, in these fibroblasts, we could block infection of these cells, suggesting that NRAMP2 is required for infection of Simbis virus in mammalian cells. Furthermore, we could deplete uh, NRAMP levels using high concentrations of iron, and that blocked the ability of fluorescently tagged virions to bind to human U2OS cells. And we were also able to co-immuno precipitate uh, virus with NRAMP2 um, from mammalian cells. This is from human cells, demonstrating that there's a direct interaction between the virus and this receptor, um, suggesting that indeed NRAMP2 is uh, an interreceptor for this virus, both in insects and in mammals. So I think that this shows that we really can use the Drosophila system to learn about um, infection in mammalian systems as well. So alpha viruses are a really large family of human pathogens. There's about 26 members, and this just some of them are shown here. And so Simbis virus actually is not very pathogenic in humans, even though it's used as the prototypical uh, member of this family. And so we wanted to look to see if other alpha viruses that are more important in human health uh, were also dependent on NRAMP for infection. And so what we did is we obtained um, chicken guinea virus, lost river virus, and Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, which again are all pathogenic in humans, and asked whether or not they might be dependent on NRAMP for infection. And so the first thing we did was use this, um, this trick where we could treat cells again with high iron, which uh, down-regulates the receptor, and we could show that while chicken guinea infection and lost river virus infection of human cells were, were unaffected by the treatment with iron, Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus was, was significantly reduced in its ability to infect cell, human cells that have been treated with iron. And so then we went to our uh, mass embryonic fibroblast that we could, where we could uh, knock out uh, NRAMP2 by uh, treating the cells with CRE. And what we found here is similar to Simbis virus, uh, we could block Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus by knocking out NRAMP2, suggesting that NRAMP is also a receptor for uh, BUE in, in human cells and mouse cells. And again, we could go back to the Drosophila system and ask if, if Venezuelan encephalitis virus infection of Drosophila cells is dependent on NRAMP. And again, we could show that by depleting cells of NRAMP, we could block the ability of this virus to infect um, in insect cells as well. So taken together, what it suggests is that, that there are some alpha viruses that are dependent on NRAMP, such as Simbis virus and Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, or others that are independent of NRAMP, such as Ross River virus and chikungunya virus. And so we've now obtained a large number of additional um, viruses in this sort of clade with, that includes uh, Western equine and Eastern equine encephalitis viruses to ask if that whole group of viruses are dependent on NRAMP for infection. And of course, we're trying to generate um, reagents to try to block NRAMP interaction with these viruses as a potential therapeutic. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears to a, a, another screen that we did uh, that I had mentioned earlier. We did a screen with West Nile virus, which obviously all of us know about since it jumped into the into New York in 1999, and now is endemic in North America. 
it, it doesn't have that much pathology, but it's related to other viruses that are globally very important, other flaviviruses. So again, we did the screen basically identically to the screen that I showed you before, where we used um, Drosophila cells on this genome-wide double-stranded RNA library, uh, did an infection, did automated imaging, and uh, automated image analysis to identify the outliers. So this screen identified more genes, but many of them were toxic. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. So again, these were all conserved with an overrepresentation of um, genes that are conserved in the case of humans and underrepresentation of Drosophila-specific genes. But we wanted to get rid of the genes that were either not conserved from that 500 and change, the genes that were toxic, and basically it was less than about 200 genes that we tested, and we found about only about half of them validated using, again, this independent double-stranded RNA and an independent cell line with an independent assay. And so we found 40 genes that um, restricted infection and, um, and another 90 genes that uh, affected infection as well the other direction. And so we wanted to look more carefully at what these genes were, and the, and the, the person in the lab that was doing these assays was interested in finding uh, pan-antiviral factors. And so we took the, the genes that were validated, conserved, and non-toxic to screen against a bunch of other viruses, including the two other families of arboviruses, as well as the vesicular stomatitis virus, and, went and did hierarchical clustering to do these comparisons. And what she found, which I thought was quite interesting, is that the positive sense viruses um, clustered together while the negative sense viruses also clustered together, suggesting that there may be some specific um, factors that are used more for plus sense viruses versus minus sense viruses, but we'd have to do more studies to figure out if that was indeed the case. So again, she was interested in identifying the pan antiviral factors, and so she found about, I don't know, a, a number of genes that impacted uh, all these viruses, and amongst these were complexes such as the TAC complex, which is required for transcription, uh, suggesting that perhaps there's a potent antiviral transcriptional response that uh, blocks it. Uh, that blocks the replication of all these viruses and thus comes out um, in this gene set. And again, there was a small number of broadly proviral genes, and as you might be able to guess, amongst this category are genes involved in endocytosis, which is the route that all four of these viruses take in order to infect cells. And so we're now trying to work on some of the, the genes within this uh, set to try to understand the mechanisms by which they're either uh, antiviral or proviral against such a a large group of viruses. Okay, so um, I just want to go through two other uh, screens that we did um, reasonably uh, superficially, because the um, and I, I want um, the reason I'm bringing them up is because they're also screens on mammalian uh, cells, just to show that this pipeline basically can work in any cell type. It's just a matter of or any assay is a matter of how much downstream validation you have to do and how hard it is to optimize the assay to have that good statistics. And so um, Carolyn Klein at the University of Pittsburgh has been very interested in understanding um, enterovirus pathogenesis. And enteroviruses can infect a large number of different tissues and they have, um, can have quite high pathogenesis in humans. And so she's done a lot of work that has shown that different uh, different enteroviruses, uh, infection of different cell types, such as the intestinal epithelium, as well as the um, blood-brain barrier, can, ha can use very different host factors. And so what we did is we decided to do a comparative study where we took um, HBMEC cells, which are blood-brain barrier endothelial cells that are polarized, and asked what the similarities and differences are between the infection of these cells with two different enteroviruses, Coxsackie B virus and poliovirus. So, so what we did was we used these HBMEC cells and optimized siRNA uh, transfection into these cells once they, and, and polarized them in 384 well plates, and then asked, um, and then infected with either Coxsackie B virus or with poliovirus, and they used the human druggable SI library at that time. Uh, the one we used was about 6,000 genes. Uh, we did this uh, in duplicate for the two different viruses, uh, and again used automated microscopy because we have a really good antibody to recognize these viruses. And again, we're looking for the genes that were knocked down, either blocked infection or promoted infection. And, in, and so here are some of the primary data from those screens where we found a significant number of genes that both increased infection and decreased infection. 
And so then we did a validation analysis where we ordered three independent siRNAs for each gene from a different company and screened those um, for for at least two SIs that uh, came out as statistically significant. And we validated about 120 genes that either impacted Toxaki B virus or poliovirus infection in these HDME C cells. What we found is the majority of genes impacted both viruses, and there were a smaller number of genes that impacted one virus or the other in these cells. And if you break up these into whether or not they led to an increased infection when you knock them down or a decreased infection, what you can see here is the, the majority of the genes that uh, that were basically innate immune that restricted infection uh, were able to restrict both Toxaki B virus and poliovirus, whereas the factors that um, were used by each virus had some had more specificity to the individual viruses. And this may be something that you would predict, but it was very interesting to see that emerge from this data set. So just to go over a little bit about what we found of these genes that were um, that restricted both viruses, they might they ended up in pathways that you might have guessed, again, further validating this gene set and this approach to identify TLR8 and IRAC1 uh, as uh, antiviral, as well as genes involved in the AKT pathway, AKT and TOR, uh, as well as genes involved in the MAP kinase pathway, including MAC, uh, K4, and ERK, suggesting that these pathways are potently antiviral and restrictive in um, these polarized endothelial cells. We also tested these genes in other cell types and found that they were restrictive in, in other human cell lines suggesting that, that these factors may be sort of non quote unquote non specific in terms of cell type as well as sort of non specific in terms of the particular viral species uh, for their restrictive mechanisms. Okay, so that's just a little overview of that screen. So I just wanted to quickly mention this last screen that we did because it uses instead of using RNAi reagents, in this case we use a cDNA overexpression screen to identify factors involved in uh, toxoplasma infection. So the toxoplasma gondii is a eukaryotic pathogen, and it has this uh, interesting uh, property where if you pre-treat cells such as macrophages shown here with interferon gamma, that activates DAC signaling phosphorylation dimerization of STAT1, which then translocates the nucleus and activates uh, interferon-stimulated genes through a gas promoter. And so what's been shown before is that if you pre-treat cells with interferon gamma and then try to infect the toxoplasma, it restricts it, so it's not able to infect. However, if you first infect the toxoplasma and then treat with interferon gamma, some, some aspect of toxoplasma infection blocks the ability of STAT1 to activate uh, gene expression. And studies by us and others show that this is actually at the level inside the nucleus. So you could still observe um, jack phosphorylation, stat one phosphorylation dimerization and nuclear import, but, but some aspects of toxoplasma was blocking the ability of nuclear stat one from potentiating gene expression. And so we, we actually developed an assay using a luciferase reporter to look at this. And so what you can see here is that when you um, when you treat cell uninfected cells with interferon gamma, you see a big increase in luminescence values. But if we pre-treat the cells with toxoplasma, you see a significant reduction in luminescence uh, after treatment with interferon gamma. And so we decided to use this as an assay to try to um, uncover the mechanism by which toxo-restricted inter uh, interferon uh, gamma induced that one signaling. Um, and so we looked for, for genes that when overexpressed to bring back the, um, the luciferase values back to wild type. And so um, basically, the question was asked, we were asking if can we overcome this toxo mediated suppression of that one signaling. And so we did, I did this in, in close collaboration with Dan Biting and David Roos's lab. And so the way that the assay is set up, we have a, a gas, uh, firefly luciferase promoter reporter vector. Um, so it only has that one binding sites and no other binding sites in the, in the vector. And so we co-transfected that with CMV-driven um, full-length cDNA clones from the MGC collection. We had about 18,000 at the time. We reverse transfected those into to human U2S cells in 384 well placed. We allowed for um, expression of the cDNAs and then infected with toxoplasma gondii for two hours. 
and then tried and then came back with interferon gamma a few first seven hours, and then we assayed the luminescence. And so here's the the values uh, from this screen that was done in duplicate robust z scores. And so what uh, so what you can see here is the ones in red were the were the wells where we actually didn't infect with toxo, and you can see that they uh, were much higher than the sort of cloud of black of the uh, rest of the um, screen. But there were some there are some wells some wells that have values that overlapped with the with the red wells, which are the wells that didn't get toxo. And so those are the genes that when overexpressed brought back up the luciferase signal. And so when we look to see what, what those genes are, there are actually 23 transcription factors uh, that fall into a number of different families shown here. And so um, that was very interesting to us because, in fact, I told you that mechanistically we know that this was happening in the nucleus, and so the fact that we identified basically all transcription factors suggests that uh, we may be identifying mechanisms either used by toxo to restrict or mechanisms that could overcome this toxo-dependent restriction. And so, uh, as I said, they fall into these different transcription fam transcription-related families shown here, and we were particularly interested in, in the, the two nuclear hormone receptors that we identified because those make good drug targets. And so, again, we identified two uh, orphan nuclear hormone receptors called TLX and TF2 in this gene set, and we validated these um, in a number of different ways. But one of the things that we were interested in is whether or not they could potentiate stat-dependent targets um, and not just this reporter. And, in fact, in, in the U2S cells, when we looked at endogenous targets of stat1, such as CXCL9, 10, and 11, we could see that uh, overexpression of CUB2 uh, or TLX led to a significant increase in these endogenous targets. We also looked at macrophage cells and saw something similar, all the magnitude was reduced, that overexpression of these two fourth nuclear hormone receptors could indeed potentiate uh, endogenous targets. So then we're interested a little bit more in what the mechanism might be, and so we wanted to know if these genes could uh, directly interact with that one, and so we did, um, did some co-IPs where we could, we could see that uh, we could pull down uh, TLX and coop tf 2 um, with, with phosphostat um, only upon interferon gamma stimulation. And, we, and so this data suggests that indeed uh, the mechanism by which these genes might be um, activating stat one targets is by acting as co-activators um, uh, on the promote on stat one promoters. And so obviously we have more work to do, but we think that this is another complementary approach to RNAi screening to identify cellular factors that impact um, host pathogen interactions. And so I just wanted to end with that, just to say that I think you can use these, these high throughput methodologies to identify factors involved in any biology you're interested in, but certainly to dissect the, the host pathogen interactions by identifying cellular factors that are both required for infection and that restrict infection. And we're hoping that we can use these uh, new findings to develop new therapeutic strategies. I also think, personally, that the comparisons of different viral families uh, will allow us to reveal the commonalities versus specializations between particular classes of pathogens and so with emerging new, new pathogens all the time, if we could find a, a sort of a discrete set of common targets used by classes of viruses, we might be able to intervene uh, much more uh, quickly and readily. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the people in my lab who contributed to the, the work that I showed you today, as well as our collaborators, including uh, John Koganesh, David Lewis, Carolyn Coyne, and Bob Dome. And I'd like to thank my funding sources. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. So um, thank you very much, Sarah. While um, people are submitting questions, I will um, just um, uh, take us to a little uh, introduction, reintroduction of um, black devices, high kind of screening systems. So you just heard Sarah. And uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A window. And uh, Jane Hesse on the phone will be um, uh, compiling those questions. So I just uh, Sarah's been using the image, image Express Micro, and I wanted to let uh, the audience know about some improvements we've made to both the Image Express Micro line and the Meta Express line. Um, so the Image 
Microsoft Plus Micro has been uh, recently uh, been updated to include uh, to include a, a model we called Microsoft Micro XL. It includes a uh, new large field of view um, optics that allow you to capture three times the number of objects in a single single image. What that would do for some of the low resolution assays that I believe were um, shown here, um, with, with a four X objective, you'd get be able to get a single clean for well in a single image um, with the four X objective. And then a 10X, you'd be able to do the only need four images to collect uh, data from the entire well. Additionally, we've uh, the, the product has a solid state light source so that. Uh, you eliminate the requirements of a shot and you have on, on demand illumination and um, uh, you limit the requirements for changing light bulbs. So those two uh, things are, are in our new image plus micro XL. Additionally, and this is sort of uh, the type of uh, uh, images and data you might get from this. This is a sort of proof of principle assay comparing a uh, standard uh, high current screen system on the left and uh, the number of cells you would get from that, about 120, how many images you need to take to acquire, um, uh, to get the most of a well, and the uh, uh, scaled image on the right from the uh, IX and XL, how many cells you get, you get more than three times as many cells. You can acquire the same number of uh, sites field of view in um, about a third number of uh, sites. Um, and uh, and you maintain or improve your uh, your asset quality. And just to give you a general guidance on, you know, how long it will take to acquire this is a nine, for a 96 cell plate, uh, two color uh, assay it would take about four minutes. Because um, these, uh, additionally with the large field of view, we are using a, uh, a detector with a larger dynamic range and that, uh, that image is shown on the left and the standard uh, camera is shown on the right. Um, with the, uh, this larger dynamic range image, you are able to uh, resolve uh, dim uh, objects, like in this example, uh, neurites, in the background of high fluorescent, uh, fluorescence much more readily. Um, Additionally, because of the large uh, images, we just want uh, your image processing time might might uh, uh, increase because of the large images. I just want to remind you that we have a product called MetExpress PowerCore that allows you to parallelize the image analysis portion that takes modules and runs them across multiple cores, and that drives uh, with about somewhere between four and twelve cores. You can be fast. Your acquisition analysis time can be faster than your acquisition time. Um, and if you have multiple systems, you're, you you buy more cores, and you can drive your analysis time down to the minutes, down to minutes three faster than your acquisition. So uh, this is a picture of the matrix of Micro XL. Um, in a screening setting, you would be able to run more screens because your acquisition time would be uh, um, essentially three times faster because in many settings, people are acquiring multiple sites per well. Uh, we have tools to perform a hit selection faster to uh, speed up your analysis. Uh, it, it's a reliable, it's a reliable product with uh, in, uh, improved reliability from a uh, solid state light source, and um, we make sure we maintain a high image quality with this product and allows you to grow with your expanding applications. If you want to learn more, please go to highsuperimaging.com uh, to learn more about that product. And so, just a reminder, uh, hopefully, this has been sending questions in, and here's uh, a reminder of how to uh, do that. Okay? So, um, uh, after the after the Q&A session, this webinar will be posted in one to two weeks. You are, you are welcome to talk, uh, send um, uh, questions directly to us afterwards as well. My, my email address and Sarah's. Sarah. So on that note, um, please, um, uh, Jane, um, sorry, go ahead and um, ask, and ask questions that have come in. All right, and. Um I'll also ask for if she's got any questions specifically uh, to her, she can answer them whenever she feels like. But I do have a couple of questions from the attendees. Um, first of all, I wonder, Sarah, if you could repeat what type of RNAi delivery mechanism you used for the Drosophila cells versus the mammalian cells. For example, um, was it led to virus SRNA or SHRNA? 
Yeah, so for the Drosophila cells, they're long double-stranded RNAs that um, are taken up by the cells without the use of the transfection reagent. And for the RNAi screens that we've been doing in mammalian cells, we've been using uh, siRNAs, uh, siRNAs and using reverse transfection to get the siRNAs into the mammalian cells. All right, and then um, I had a question about what uh, sort of magnification do you usually do your RNA screening at? So for the Drosophila cells, they're really small. We usually do them at 20x, and for the mammalian cells, um, in general, we do them at 10x, but if we're looking at subcellular localization of particular antigens, we do those at 20x as well. All right, and then uh, another one was, the question was, Sort of how are you creating your reagents or compounds to block the N ramp? Uh, so we're uh, doing a number of different things to do that, but we're collaborating with Chris Broder, who's generating um, humanized monoclonal to the to the extracellular loops, and we're screening those to look for ones that can block infection. For example, we're also trying to map the determinants of the interaction on the different extracellular loops of the of the of NRAMP to try to identify the particular residues and whether or not we can uncouple um, iron transport from infection, because that obviously would be useful. But we don't know yet if we can or we can't. Okay, I see. And so at the moment, you've answered all the questions that um, were sent to me generally, unless you've got any um, additional questions. So, Sarah, I have, a, I have a question based on what you said. So, you're, you're working with a collaborator to, to develop these monoclonal antibodies. Yeah. Do you see that as eventual therapies uh, in, in, in humans? Or, it could um, be a passive therapy, yeah. yeah. And do you have to screen those monoclonal antibodies in a, in a, in a sort of high chronic screening system or, or not anymore? Um, we do, just because we have these assays all set up. We do everything where we do, you know, dilutions of antibodies, et cetera, on 96 or 384 plates and use automated imaging, just because we have all these assays already optimized and set up. Great. Are there, I see that uh, there are other RNA screen uh, groups on the line. Are there any other questions or um, for Sarah? Um, do not see a whole flood of questions coming in. I think this was a great talk, and I really appreciate uh, uh, Sarah you joining us and uh, uh, talking to this audience. Thank you. Okay. Okay. On that note, I since uh, I'll just give one more minute, but I don't see a, a large list of questions coming in. I think at this time we will say bye and please uh, join us uh, again um, for. Our, um, you know, we'll be having another webinar in a couple of weeks, um, and we continue to um, uh, try to gather speakers. If you are a user of the Image Access Micro or any of our Image Access Line, and you would like to uh, have something to see the speaker, please drop me an email, and um, we would love to um, uh, have you speak on, our, uh, on about your research. Okay? And we will speak to you at the next webinar. Thank you very much.